Bob, one of the most important aspects of uh, neurological systems is the ability to discover and do new things, however small the, the neurological system is in animals. In human beings, we talk about creativity. And those who are in the arts, uh, even when I'm in the finance and business world, I'm always thinking about how to be creative. From a neuropsychological point of view and understanding our brains and creativity, uh, what, what progress has been made and what do you look that can happen in the future regarding understanding creativity? We've been incredibly lucky here at UCLA that uh, Michael Tenenbaum and his family supported a center to study the biology of creativity. And I've been lucky enough to be a director of that center. And it's really fantastic, um, the process we've gone through. Because you can imagine, having been a graduate of UCLA, how um, the UCLA scientists struggle to think, how can we wrap our heads around the biology of creativity? Because you know, we tend to be more serious, sober, um, and, and uh, skeptical scientists. Right. Uh, so we um, went for a brief retreat to think, how are we going to study the biology of this? And of course, we want to understand the basic biological mechanisms of it. So we had to really try to think about what are the component processes of creativity. We started with the idea, well, creativity is fundamentally a cognitive uh, representation mm -hmm. um, and the cognitive construct. So what are the sub-constructs, the, the cognitive components of creativity that we can study, not only in humans, but because any basic scientific progress is going to require that we be able to study other species. Sure. So we start thinking about what are the kinds of component cognitive constructs of creativity that we can study in humans and in other species. And we came up with some, what I think, really interesting ideas that are, that are yielding fruit. So one of them is the processes of memory and working memory. What we believe is that the entire process of being able to connect things in mind, to generate inductive solutions, and to be able to do divergent thinking, to connect together two things that have never been mm. connected before, mm. you have to be able to represent those two things in your mind to be able to see those new connections. So there are the mechanisms of being able to maintain activation states in the brain is critically important. And so there we've been doing work uh, together with some of our brilliant investigators here like Alcino Silva uh, to show that um, uh, we can create and genetically engineer mice that have better working memory than other mice. And so through that, we now know the genetic mechanisms and the cellular mechanisms that support better working memory. And this is now suggesting new treatments. Another big component of creativity is generativity or generation capacity. If we want to know what's the best single predictor of creative achievement, it's just the number of achievements how many things you produce. So you think about Picasso, who produced more than 10,000 works in his life. Um, he was a very creative person. It turns out that most people who are identified as being highly creative have produced a lot of stuff. And so just the ability to just do things, keep on generating new products, is very important. Well, which is cause and which is effect? Uh, how, how do you, well, that, that seems like you're stating the, the, the problem, that seems like circular reasoning. Well, I think that it's not so much because there are many, if you think about the process, many people think about in order to become creative is, that, oh, I got to think about it for a while before I do anything. Oh. I have to, you know, uh, germinate oh. um, the idea before I will be able to do something creative. Turns out that tends not to be true by and large, and that what really tends to be associated with the most creative achievement is just doing more stuff. People who keep on putting stuff out there, even if it's wrong, they trash some of it and they go back and do it again and again and again. That's what's most associated with uh, creative achievement. And so we've been studying birds who have a particular critical period when they generate song. And Stephanie White is one of the scientists here been doing this work. And now with those birds, we can see which are the genes in their brains that turn on the neural circuits that enable the little boy birds to begin to sing creatively. And it turns out that the creativity in the boy bird song is what attracts the girl birds. <laughs> and so this is a you know, wonderful example of a critical period in development for these brain functions for generativity. And we now understand the neural circuits that are involved in that and also the genetic basis mm -hmm. of that. So you have working memory, generativity. Right. Now another, yes. another component of creativity is inhibition, the ability to inhibit mm -hmm. responses. And now many people think, oh yes, to be creative, you probably have to disinhibit your responses and be uninhibited. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we think it's just the opposite. What you have to do is be able to inhibit habitual responses. Creativity, mm -hmm. the biggest enemy of creativity is habit. Yeah. So to be able to break habits requires being able to actively suppress the first thing that comes to mind. 
So you have to not pick the low hanging fruit from your cognitive tree, mm. and you have to reach deeper into the tree. Mm. And that usually takes time and the ability to inhibit the first thing that comes to mind uh, and ultimately get to more uh, elaborate and exciting ideas. Yeah, and there could be some social constraints about inhibiting things that are part of the status quo, the normal way of doing things. So you have to be a little bit uh, a, a risk uh, taking to, to do that. That's right. In fact, in one of our research studies, um, we've been focusing on uh, healthy people and just looking at uh, variations in healthy, normal creativity. And what we find is that a personality characteristic that's associated with that is the lack of agreeableness. <laughs> so that uh, disagreeableness or non-conformism mm -hmm. might be another way to put it, mm -hmm. uh, seems to be uh, critically associated with creativity. Mm. There are also other traits like openness to new experience that are, that are also involved. But this disagreeableness seems to be a key part <laughs> and not, uh, not being willing to abide by the status quo, mm. always questioning uh, and, and being willing to wait and take the next step. Uh, that's another key component. Yeah, and how have you been able to relate some of these to biological mechanisms? Some of them seem easier, maybe like working memory, mm -hmm. and some of them seem much more difficult, like uh, disagreeableness. Right. Now, disagreeableness is something that we're um, beginning to tackle. We right now have um, our, our DNA uh, being processed to look at the relationships between traits like disagreeableness and uh, um, uh, the entire genome, and we'll see if that bears fruit. Meanwhile, though, we've got, um, uh, with respect to response inhibition, an experiment done by our colleague David Yench, where he took transgenic mice and looked at their ability to reverse responses. And the um, ability to reverse a response requires actively overcoming an established mm -hmm. habit. Right. And uh, he's been able to localize um, in the genome um, a particular locus that's highly associated with this ability to do a reversal learning process. And then in separate experiments, um, we've identified some cellular circuitry within the basal ganglia uh, and the specific genes that control that circuitry that seem to be critically involved in a go, no go opposition circuit. And you're confident that those genes really do relate to that single trait? It seems like that's a, a very a long uh, a gap to bridge. Yeah, well, with any of these complex traits, there's so many contributions. Yeah. That any one of these components is just going to be one facet. But I think that by understanding each one of these facets at a deep biological level, it's going to enable us to then piece these things together and understand what their relative contributions are to, to the higher functions. In looking at creativity in humans versus creativity in other uh, uh, mammals, do, do you see any fundamental difference in human creativity? Well, you know, not really. I mean, not at the level that we're looking at it. And there's always been the question between whether there's a, a difference qualitatively between the big C kinds of creativity that's associated with creative genius right. and little c creativity, the creative acts that we right. pursue right. Uh, in, in our daily lives. Sure. So far, I've encountered nothing that leads me to believe that there's anything that's exactly unique about the big C kinds of creativity and that every example I've seen seems to be explicable based on the combination of traits that are available to all of us well, there are two, part of little c creativity. There are two potential step functions. One is from the, the, the simple learning kind of creativity, because learning itself is kind of a creative activity that, that other animals do and that humans do in general. Then the second potential step function, which may not be a step function, maybe it is between the small c, the creativity that we do, and the, the, the Mozarts and the Einsteins of human history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so far as I can tell in looking at every example I've seen so far, if you account for all of the little c components and you factor in things like the intensity of practice, the, you know, the 10,000 hour phenomenon, right. um, these kinds of uh, you know, mastery of expertise and being able then to deploy those circuits um, in a concerted way um, doesn't seem to be discontinuous between the geniuses and the rest of people. They seem to have a combination of exercising those basic traits that we all have uh, combined with being in the right time and uh, sure. in the right place. Serendipity is always a, a wonderful uh, tool to be creative. That's right. There's a stochastic process uh, that unfolds <laughs> right. and, and probably makes some right. of the difference. Right. Uh, right. Uh, in, in the investment banking world, my favorite adage is it's better to be lucky than smart. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right. So we think that to study the basic biological components of creativity in this way is going to give us some of the tools that will help us to understand 
little c creativity, how that relates to big C creativity, understand if there's really a difference or not. We're studying that empirically. But I think that by understanding these basic mechanisms, we're going to be able to give people tools that they can use to support and enhance their own personal creativity in a way that has not been possible before. And I hope we're going to get some leverage by understanding these basic biological facts.